we can, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, this is kind of the center point for the semester, and uh, for many of us, the high point of the semester for all sorts of reasons. Um, we have Will Allen here, which I'll, who I'll be introducing in a little bit. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, Charlie, do you want to say anything about the larger conference? I know you've let people know about it, but perhaps a couple words. Just from here? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Triangle University Food Studies has been uh, in the midst of uh, a conference that's going on at UNC today. It'll continue tomorrow. Uh, will Allen will be the keynote uh, for that conference all day long tomorrow. We'll have various workshops and so forth. The last I heard, um, almost everything has, has already filled and sold out. Um, but the great news is we have Will Allen here today to give us a preview of what he will be saying tomorrow. So it's all going great, and it's, there are 500 and some people in the auditorium, and that's sold out, just giving us some indication of how much interest there is on campus. Great. Thank you. Um, another housekeeping thing is um, that papers are due at the next class meeting. Just a reminder, we know we need to remind you many different ways. Uh, so please remember that. And if you have any further questions about the papers, um, please do raise them in your small group meetings. Um, the third thing is, um, alas, uh, because of the demands of my job, um, there is a reason for a high turnover rate among deans. Um, I will not be able to join you for the meal uh, this week again. Um, but I hope to be fully back engaged uh, after uh, this week. But I did want to let you know why. Um, I'm going to be leading a, a larger university administrator conversation around diversity and how we can do better around uh, questions and practices of diversity. And uh, so it's kind of uh, important that I be there. I've been part of the thinking behind how we might make a new approach to diversity. And as you, you all know that uh, diversity issues have come up a lot in this class. So um, wish me well and I will be thinking of you as uh, I do that other thing. I haven't yet found the formula for cloning, but if any of you find it, I will be happy to, to take it in. Um, so before we do the framing, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on our most wonderful speaker. Um, he is Will Allen. He is the farmer in chief, in chief of Growing Power. Growing Power transforms communities by supporting people from diverse backgrounds and the environments in which they live through the development of community food systems, which we're going to be hearing about a little today. These systems provide high quality, safe, healthy, and affordable food for all residents in a community. And particularly, Growing Power develops community food centers as a key component of community food systems through training, active demonstration, outreach, and technical assistance. And Will Allen um, believes in relationship to this idea that if people can grow safe, healthy, affordable food, if they have access to land and clean water, this is transformative on every level in a community. I believe we cannot have healthy communities without a healthy food system. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about Will Allen. He is the son of a sharecropper, former professional basketball player, ex-corporate sales leader, and now farmer. Um, he's become recognized among the preeminent thinkers on our time on agriculture and food policy, which we heard a lot about last week. The founder and CEO of Growing Power, um, which is based in Milwaukee, he's widely considered the leading authority in the expanding field of urban agriculture. At Growing Power and in the community food projects that he started across the nation and around the world, he believes that all people should have access to fresh, safe, affordable, and nutritious food at all times. And using methods that he's developed over a lifetime, Will trains community members to become community farmers, assuring them a secure source of good food without regard to political or economic forces. And one of the things that came up last week is how do we deal with global economic forces? In 2008, Will was named a MacArthur Fellow and was awarded a prestigious Foundation Genius Grant for his work, and he is the only the second farmer ever to be honored with a MacArthur Fellowship. 
and he's a member of the Clinton Global Initiative, and he was invited to the White House in February of 2010 to join Michelle Obama in, in launching Let's Move, her signature leadership program to reverse childhood obesity in America. And in May 2010, time honored Will to the 100 uh, world's most influential people. So please join me in welcoming our honored guests. I also wanted to mention that Andrea Rusing, um, who is uh, the um, uh, owner and chef at Lantern in Chapel Hill, is not going to be able to join us because of an illness uh, in her family. Um, but her hors d'oeuvres are here, even if she is not. Um, and just a little bit about her: she is her. Uh, the Lantern was pinpointed as one of the best. Uh, food towns. Uh, the the reason why Chapel Hill was pin, point, point, pinpointed as one of the best food towns in America is partly because of uh, Lantern, and she is the leader of the North Carolina slow food mo movement. And she joins uh, Alice Waters and Michael Pollan as a featured speaker for the Slow Food Conference in Italy um, later this fall. So uh, the only thing to say um, uh, about um, uh, Andrea is that uh, we pray that she doesn't run for political office. It would be difficult to run both the restaurant and the state of North Carolina, but knowing mm -hmm. Rusing, she could manage it. So I'm sure we'll taste in her hors d'oeuvre something wonderful. So Kathy and Charlie helped us um, over our discussions this week to recap where we are and to think about what Will Allen's contribution is, given the nature of our debate to date. Um, we have had a sense of um, the enchantment involved with agrarianism and lack of our eating, with growing your own f food, with connection with founding fathers and American dreams. Um, we have the idea that it's a practice that tastes great, is better for you, almost magical in a way. We've also learned through Rosenberg's, Gabe Rosenberg and Charlie's lecture that the local narrative has always been deeply influenced and uh, even manipulated by larger structures like government and corporations. Um, in a way, we might think of the farmer as actually uh, being uh, controlled by the powers behind the scenes. And when we looked at, Rachel, at um, um, Phyllis Pomerantz's uh, discussion of the world scale last week, we think about the mind-boggling effect of this. And I know many of you in your conversations in small groups last week um, all try to incorporate this global into the intensely local conversation we've been having up to this point. And it is indeed um, a kind of vertigo to try and do that. The worldwide drive to industrialize has left many people very hungry, one billion in fact. The agrarian response to that hungry is, uh, hunger is largely that we should all return to pre-industrialized states, perhaps like the Manning reading that we had before, and that technology drives us further and further away from nature. Um, so according to one position, we need to reject our TVs and, and in the U.S. and in the Global South, TVs as a kind of stand-in or metonym for industrialization. Um, and the opposition says something very different, which is industry is good, TVs are good, a globalized world is good, corporations, uh, we can strive to make corporations better, and one way of doing that is to get them to invest in local economies worldwide. Um, we want to relieve suffering, um, hence food aid. Is it perfect? No, but we can make it better. We need to grow 70% more food by 2050, and we can only do so with more technology. We're going to be hearing about that from Britt Barter um, later on, in fact, the next class. And enter Will Allen. Um, he is really brilliant at bridging both sides of this very entrenched debate. Both Lockevores and global food people claim him as their own. How can this be? On the surface, Will looks very much like a community garden advocate, but with two important differences. He is completely invested in getting the food to the people and making sure they know how to cook and eat it. He doesn't grow to make money at high-priced, inflated farmer's markets and restaurants. He's not invested in gourmet culture. And there's a great documentary called Food Fight that Kathy mentioned um, that reminds us that it pits Alice Waters and Michael Pollan against Will Allen. Waters and Pollen are arguing it tastes so good, come to our high-end restaurants and try it. And Alan is saying, let's figure out how to make this food taste like people want it to taste. 
like what they're used to in their grandmother's kitchens. They don't want to eat at McDonald's, but do they have any other options? So he hosts cook-ins and dinner parties, and urban people come and rediscover what to do with collards and kale, and it's all free. The second thing about Alan is that he's not afraid of technology and doesn't want to hold himself up to an agrarian ideal. Realizing that local gardens deplete soil minerals, he started working on systems of vertical agriculture where plants and produce grow at eye level, so the water flows through their soil. It filters into massive fish tanks, feeding tilapia and catfish. And water is pumped from the fish tank back into plants and soil. It's conserved through fish waste. Plus, people now have the fish to eat. Um, so these are some wonderful ways of making a new ecology in urban agriculture. Um, and I think this is uh, a really interesting middle path. And one of the things that uh, Kathy and Charlie know about me is that sometimes it feels like in our co contemporary culture, taking a position is the only, uh, at the extreme, is the only possible way to move public discourse. I'm a deep believer in the both and, and Will Allen in steering a middle path has really given us some wonderfully interesting and viable options. So please welcome me, uh, welcome, join me in welcoming Will Allen, I'm a little tired, thanks. <laughs> you can welcome me too if you like. <laughs> This is the place that I, I could land, and that's when I got in trouble. <laughs> I knew a little bit about the area. Five blocks away is the largest housing project we have here in Milwaukee, now West Lawn. It was uh, pretty much a, a, what is called a food desert, and the only access to food is corner stores and what they call fast food swamps. 
As a matter of fact, many of our kids are eating food that our grandmothers wouldn't recognize as food. I was just in Cleveland. I met with the mayor of Cleveland, and uh, he really gets it. We're starting to get a lot of waste from uh, food wholesalers. They throw away thousands and thousands of pounds of food waste a week. I want the same food to go to all uh, all people in all communities. And to do that, you have to figure out ways of reducing uh, the production cost. And part of that is what we do here in terms of growing soil uh, by using renewable energy to keep the cost in line so we can get that food to everybody at a reasonable cost. People come here, they want to know, how did you do that here? You know, how good did you make that happen on these three acres? How can we do that? This farm system is a unique farm system that's part of, uh, I think, ag of the future in terms of how we grow food here very intensively uh, using uh, every square foot and everything that we discover we pass on to uh, folks that come here. It's not like we want to stick it in some closet and try to make money off of it. Everything we discover we pass on to other folks. I don't think I've ever interviewed anyone who is officially named a genius by a major foundation. How did you find out that you were getting the Arthur Genius Award? In our city, we have a lot of vacant land. In the Big West, there's hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of acres inside cities. Cities like Detroit. Cities like uh, Youngstown, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, uh, Chicago, where they have 77,000 vacant lots, so 33 square miles of vacant land. Then we can grow food. a diverse group of folks to work with. So diversity is at the top of my agenda. One of the declarations I made with the city was that I would hire kids from the community. Then we started being looked at uh, as an asset to the community because we were providing jobs. I live 10 blocks up from here, and I used to walk out here every day when I was in high school to go to the basketball court. And one day I just stopped in by the year. I would have never thought that I would be doing something like this. Whoever wants help, whether they're from Detroit or some small rural community in Alabama or Mississippi or upstate in Wisconsin, we engage those communities. So it's not just inner city, it's not just urban, it's rural communities that are hurting uh, today as well. But it's really all about food and how we uh, are going to try to change the existing food system to make it uh, something that really works for everybody. People think because they spend a lot of money for food, that food is uh, fresh and good. But we know when food travels many miles, it loses a lot of its nutrient uh, value. And the system that we need is to go back to those days where food system was local. A sustainable food system is the only way to really end hunger in the world. Uh, the industrial food system, it, it hasn't worked. We have to change our food policy, our national food policy. And to do that, we need concrete projects like this and others around the country to change policy. We just can't compete with one in D.C. or standing in line and trying to lobby for something. We have to prove that this works. We have to prove that this cash flow. It's something that we uh, need to continue to, to grow. There are some challenges that we have to overcome uh, to make it grow. You know, for my athlete, you know, I like competition and I like challenges. I've always wanted to guard the best player, take the last shot in the game or whatever. You know, I, I like that kind of challenging. And if you can transfer that over into something like this, it becomes a very powerful and uh, good thing for the community.
I was coming to Duke University, and uh, everybody says, are you sure they're going to let you on campus? <laughs> uh, I, I went to uh, University of Miami, and I understand, uh, even though I don't have a, a a lot of time to watch basketball games lately. Do you have any basketball fans here? <laughs> Everybody I know. Uh, but they, uh, some of my colleagues said, uh, are you sure they're going to let you on campus? You know, you know, University of Miami just beat you. Down here, and that's a rarity. You know? so, but it was great to uh, be here. Uh, I've been in the state quite a bit uh, in the past. Uh, we have a regional, uh, national regional training center in Raleigh with an organization called the Food Shuttle. So um, I'll actually be coming back here uh, quite a bit in the future. And, uh, and I want to thank Charlie before we get started because uh, he's uh, kind of taken good care of me since I've been here. I recently had a hip replacement from my old basketball days. And uh, I need all the help I can get. So I never turn down help when somebody says, you know, I'll help carry a bag or I'll do that. You know? uh, but it's, it's great to see that uh, we have classes like this uh, today. As I travel around the country, I speak at a lot of universities, and I, I'm starting to see this, this movement has grown into uh, what I call the good food revolution. Uh, and, and that's going to be totally necessary, and, and your generation is really going to change the dynamics of uh, how we secure our food, how we eat our food, how we start eating more nutritious food, how we understand, because most of us really don't understand when we sit down at a meal what we're really eating and the, and the nutritional value of, of the food. Uh, it was mentioned in, in this uh, uh, video about food that's shipped from far away because our soils today are 50% less fertile than it was in 1950. So we're already starting at 50% uh, less fertile soil that we're growing in. And when we uh, pick our crops, say, in Salinas Valley, and it, uh, we, the, the crops stay at least a day out in the field because of weather, it's kind of cool out there. Um, and then it goes into uh, a refrigeration. It may stay in the refrigeration about three days before broker calls and orders it to start heading this way. Uh, and by the time it gets uh, into our stomachs, a lot of times that food is seven, 10, 11 uh, days old. Uh, but us unsuspecting customers, when you go and buy food at the grocery store, you don't know. You don't know that. So we don't really know that much about our food. And a lot of the food, a lot of the food that we eat, uh, uh, whether it's fresh fruits and vegetables, that you're eating a lot of cellulose. So it's not doing your body uh, good. And of course, our food uh, is something that uh, uh, we actually take, uh, you know, I've been using this term, we take medicine three times a day in our food. Our food is our medicine. Uh, some of us eat good medicine, some of us eat uh, bad medicine. Uh, but our food should be something that keeps us healthy uh, throughout our lives. And what we've seen lately is more disease, more obesity, uh, because of the high sugar and salt contents of our food and the way food is distributed, the way you, uh, food, there's not good food access in many of our communities, and that, that makes this whole thing about food and social justice. That's what it's really all about. Because we cannot have sustainable communities, and if you uh, look at cities around the country, and I speak to almost every mayor in major cities now, they all want to be uh, have sustainable and green uh, cities by 2020. That's the big thing. In the case of Cleveland, uh, Mayor Jackson wants the city to be sus uh, sustainable and green by 2019. He wants to beat everybody to the punch. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. But anyway, uh, it's really important that we all participate to make that happen because it's really about our survival as a species to make sure that we have, uh, we develop uh, a system. And people always ask me or uh, my friend Michael Pollan, uh, what about the industrial food system? What's going to happen to that? Well, the industrial food system isn't going to go away. But I think what's important is that when you walk into um, a grocery store, whether it's Walmart or your local co-op, that you have choices. And right now, we don't have very many choices in terms of local food. 
and it's poorly labeled. If you go into a major grocery store, you have to really search for a local label instead of having these local sections and so forth. So that's some of the work that I do uh, in terms of our food being able to get distributed in every, every uh, way you can think of, whether it's restaurants, co-ops, um, uh, CSA, uh, do you guys know what CSAs are? Okay, you've probably been talking about that stuff. We have a CSA uh, program that, uh, that goes year-round because it's always been my uh, contention that we eat food, uh, good food, year-round, not just uh, 20 weeks out of the year or during the growing season, but we eat that good food year-round. That's really important. And you might think of a state like Wisconsin where I li have lived the last 35 years, but that's not possible, but it is possible because we're growing food year-round. And we're doing it um, in very innovative kind of, kinds of ways. We're using compost to heat uh, greenhouses and uh, hot mix, something we call hot mix, where we mix uh, carbon and nitrogen and it creates heat up to 150 degrees and we can heat those uh, greenhouses or hoop houses or high tunnels or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and keep that food going throughout the winter. And if we can do it in Wisconsin, you can do it anywhere in the country. You can do it much easier in the South. And with all the bug pressure uh, of the South growing food inside high tunnels, and uh, that's something that even uh, USDA now has a program to help farmers build these high tunnels so we can grow food and really protect ourselves because we have unpredictable weather patterns today. Being a farmer is a very very risky business because of uh, many things. A little bug. That's one thing about farming that will keep you humble is the fact that there's so many factors that will knock you to your knees. You know, a little bug can destroy your crop if you're not on top of it. Uh, bad weather, storms, winds can uh, destroy your infrastructure. So farming is a very risky business. But we, we have to come up with innovative ways of doing it. We have so many vacant buildings. With the downturn in our economy, it's offered us some tremendous opportunities to help change our food system. I'll give you an example. In Milwaukee, we have hundreds of foreclosures on major buildings. Instead of looking at those buildings and let them sit there, we can, we can grow fish in those buildings. We can take aquaculture because guess what? Our lakes and streams and oceans are polluted. 50% of the fish that we eat today is farm-raised. That's going to go to 75% in the next five years because of what happened in Japan, what happened in the Gulf. So it's a tremendous business opportunity for folks that want to get into, into farming. Uh, when I look at you guys, I look at you guys as the future because not everybody in this room wants to be a farmer who sticks his hands in the ground. But in the kind of farm system I'm talking about, there'll be hundreds of different categories of jobs. We need, we need nutritional people, we need architects, we need planners, we need, uh, uh, we need renewable energy folks. We need innovative ideas to build a system that m helps us grow food on less acreage because as we sit here to, right now, we're losing farmland. We're losing fertile farmland and we're lose, still losing our rural farmers small farmers, family farmers. So how do we turn that around? We turn that around by introducing new folks who've never farmed, who don't come from traditional farm families, but want to do this. And as I travel around the country, I've seen this grow. I've seen this grow from an academic kind of uh, food system. A lot of academic folks were involved in planning and uh, doing uh, feasibility studies and all kinds of stuff to crusty old farmers like myself were part of that system. But now what I see over 40%, over, uh, I'm sorry, over 60% of the people that want to be in this are under 40 years of age. So that's been a huge change in, a, in the last, uh, I would say five, actually the last five years. And a major change has been because of the leadership. A lot of times this is a grassroots movement. It really is. It's a grassroots movement, and that's what's helped us grow. But uh, having some help from the top, when the first lady uh, put that 1,200 foot square foot garden at the White House, it moved 10 million people into growing food in their backyards and side yards and on their balconies for the first time. 
10 million people. So uh, from that point, a couple of years ago, it's grown into this national movement around uh, uh, let's move uh, her signature program to getting let's move cities. There's over 500 cities that are trying to become let's move cities. And you see it on the NFL games, uh, let's play or go or whatever they call it. Uh, that's all part of it. Uh, but in my mind, the most important piece of the three pillars we talk about is nutrition, we talk about exercise, and we talk about stress management. I believe two-thirds of it is in that nutritional arena because if we can fix that, that solves a lot of things. It's preventative, but that nutritional piece is a preventative medicine piece because if we can eat the right things and we can eat local food and we can get, uh, when we eat something, we get that full nutritional impact uh, of what we're putting into our system, that will solve a lot of problems. So we have to fix that piece and uh, then we can move on. But uh, that's not going to happen unless we have everybody at the table. It's really important for us to, to really start thinking about uh, who's at the table because 10 years ago we wouldn't want corporate, corporate America at the table. We wouldn't want medical folks or even universities at the table. We just wanted farmers and people that are working in the food system, but we need everybody at the table we need to extract the strengths of every organization uh, to be able to make this new food system work. Because we can't do it alone. No, no longer can we kick people away from the table and say we can do it by ourselves. It's not going to work. So I call this the good, revolu good food revolution table. We need everybody there. And, and then we can start building those relationships that lead to partnerships. And we have to understand how the system works. Most people have no idea how the system works. Many of our schools, our schools is where the worst food, our students eat the worst food of anybody. Because they only have, school systems only have about $2 uh, to feed each student per meal. $2. If I gave each and every one of you $2 a day and said, let's go out and try to find a healthy meal this afternoon. How many of you think you could find a really good meal on $2? Probably couldn't. But we sit in classrooms, and I've been in those classrooms, and the teachers talk about healthy food, and that's great. And then we march these kids down to the cafeteria. We talk about, hey, blueberries and uh, kale, those top five, two of the top five most nutritious. Then we march the kids down the hall and feed them some canned beans with so much salt and stuff in it. You know stuff like that. So we really that doesn't. If I'm a, if I'm a young person, I'm going to question that. Why am I eating this lousy stuff? You're telling me about this uh, food I should be eating over here. But schools are, you know. So something's wrong with that that picture. So we have to fix that, and uh, we have to fix it at, in Washington. And the only way to fix it is to really show people that this system we're talking about works. You can't just go and stand in line. I've been to D.C. I've been, uh, you know, I didn't go in there with a blue suit and a tie and all that, like the, like the uh, lobbyists, but I see what happens, you know. And uh, we're not going to be able to win that war. We're going to have to come up with some concrete models, some examples of how this works, of how this cash flows. And it can start right here on campus where you have a, a student garden where uh, many schools fought very hard to even have a student garden with administration in a lot of schools around the country. But this, this is, it might seem like really a small piece, but it's a major, major piece when you have a school garden. And many schools today, I remember speaking at Lawrence College last uh, summer, there were 29 universities organized by students from 29 uh, student gardens. They had a week-long conference up there. And uh, at Lawrence College, those students came to our workshops, learned how to build uh, a high tunnel. They were growing food. They are getting their food into the cafeteria at the school. I mean, that to me is, uh, is something that really uh, blew, kind of blew my mind because uh, I didn't, when those students came to, to uh, Growing Power for one of our national, international trainings, I didn't know they were going to go that far. But, you know, they were able to show those other students what is possible. 
that concrete example meant more than if they would have sit in a classroom and just talked about it. You know, just that concrete example. And that's what we have to do is we have to have these concrete examples here in Raleigh, Durham, or whatever your community that you come from, to be able to show your politicos that make a lot of decisions, that you have to move them. Because I was in Boston, the mayor brought me in a couple of weeks ago. They're changing, uh, they're writing their first food, food policy on farming in Boston. There was never, it was illegal to farm in, in the city of Boston, even though people are doing it. In many cities, it's illegal to farm in those cities, even though people are doing it. But it's important that we get it on the books that you can farm in residential, commercial, and industrial areas in the city. So that's really important stuff. So uh, when I start talking about the food system, I'm not just talking about farmers that are putting plants in the ground anymore. What we're talking about is those hundreds of different categories of jobs that will produce thousands of jobs. As a matter of fact, you don't take us serious right now. Even in my town, where we have over 100 employees, we're paying them an average of about 40000 a year. But when they think of, uh, when our, government, our state government thinks of job creation, they don't think of creating urban farms as a job creator. Even though we've created, we're going to hire 150 people. I listen to this every day, where our governor uh, talks about he's going to this factory where they're adding 25 jobs, this factory adding 50 jobs, we're adding 150 jobs, well-paying jobs, jobs that are uh, living wage jobs. You know, these aren't, uh, these aren't, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Sweatshop? <laughs> no, these aren't uh, uh, jobs that, uh, minimum wage jobs, these are way above the minimum wage. As a matter of fact, when trainees come for this program, we pay them uh, a very good starting training wage of like 12 bucks an hour, and if they make it through the year, they get a five percent automatic 5% increase as they move through our system. So um, we're not talking about the average uh, uh, wage for farm workers is about $10 an hour. So, uh, you know, that's what we can do, and we can build farms. Our goal is to build 100 acres of high tunnels in and around Milwaukee, and Chicago, and Madison, Wisconsin, those three cities that we work in. And that will change the dynamics. If we can take 10 percent more local food production, that has a huge uh, environmental impact. And that's another piece of, around the environment. So I could sit here and talk about all those stats all day, all day but I really want to show you guys uh, how we developed our how we developed our food system. I don't know if we could dim the lights for this PowerPoint. And by the way, this is, uh, We've tried. Tried this is probably uh, the largest PowerPoint you've ever seen. <laughs> it's got like a thousand images. Uh, but I'll go through it. I can go through it. I'm not going to have you guys sit here forever. Uh, we could do it in 45 minutes or 45 hours. To some, what you want from it. Oh, that's good. Nobody go to sleep now. <laughs> you know, when you dim the light sometimes. So. <clears throat> okay, uh, I bought the last remaining farm in the city of Milwaukee in 1993. And these are some of the earlier years. This is what our facility looked like. Uh, we had uh, some row crops and you'll see the transformation of this facility which is uh, about three acres. We feed 10,000 people from this facility. Very intensive uh, production and it was kind of a mess. Uh, it had been, and these were uh, the young people that I originally worked with and there's something special and different about these kids and the kids today. These kids are over 30 years old now but uh, can anybody tell me what's different about these kids and kids today? Skinny. They're skinny. No, they have their pants pulled up. <laughs> so. uh, then we started some small composting um, back then, and uh, we moved along a continuum. You can see the greenhouse in the background. It had no glass uh, in it. There was a real fixer-upper. Uh, we did a little, uh, some field crops in the back, and then we started to scale up. We started uh, 
uh, putting the place back together and uh, scale up our soil because if you remember one thing I say today, it's a, when you're growing healthy food, it's all about the soil. That's what it's about. It's not about other things. We started doing vermicomposting back in those days with 30 pounds of worms. Today we have over 7,000 pounds of worms and we compost 22 million pounds of food waste into compost to grow our food. But we also started aquaponics in these three barrel configurations that we'd have uh, three barrels, uh, we'd grow about 50 tilapia. One was a weed tank, one was a fish tank, and one was the uh, filter tank, and we'd uh, put an air stone down one uh, pipe, and that would force the water, replicating a clean river or stream. Now remember this image, because uh, from this image, I was able to build a different type of a system that uh, works pretty much the same as this. So we had a number of these barrels, and it was a youth project, a heifer youth project. Uh, we also grew a lot of bedding plants back in those days, and uh, the kids would uh, take those bedding plants, uh, and they would plant them around the city at different organizations and so forth, and create summer jobs for themselves. And I would teach the kids how to grow food in that back 40 that you'll see the transformation. And one of the things I discovered back in those days was um, that these kids uh, had really, really bad uh, reading and uh, writing skills. So one of the things we did, and uh, this is kind of what they do in schools now and what we're teaching teachers about hands-on education is go out and do something hands-on and have the kids come back into the classroom and write about it. And then it would lead to the, them wanting to dig deeper and we'd give them stuff to read and the grades improved. So we know it worked back then and it works today. Um, one of the lost arts, of course, is canning. So um, we would teach the kids uh, how to preserve food and how to use tools as a life skill, and that really uh, made it interesting for them. Again, they're just not doing traditional farming. They're learning other life skills that they can use. And I used to work with the juvenile justice system, and still do, in terms of transforming kids' lives after they've gone out and done some pretty bad things. And they would go through this transition uh, uh, system where they were coming back into society. They were still on ankle braces and so forth. And uh, we would grow food. I'd bring in compost and put it on at their facility along uh, the hillsides uh, above their basketball court. And they would grow food and give back to the community because they had taken so much from the community. And now as part of that therapy, they're learning how to give back or give for the first time in their lives. So that, that really worked. And we would take neighborhood centers that had high crime uh, areas and high crime areas where uh, cars were being stole, stolen every day. We took out the shrubs along the uh, uh, area between the street and the sidewalk and we'd put it, bring compost in and we'd plant flowers. And the kids would plant these flowers that they grew in the greenhouses and we'd totally transform that uh, area, the community and that organization and uh, a wonderful thing happened. All of a sudden, all the car thefts went away because people started paying attention to the flowers, and I guess the car thieves thought they were looking at them. <laughs> so uh, it became a really good crime-fighting tool. <laughs> and it also supplied these kids with summer jobs as they would take care of these plants uh, at a time when the city had reduced uh, uh, the funding for summer jobs for these young people that were just hanging out and uh, we had high crime. But it also beautified those communities. People started feeling better about their community by having uh, these flowers to soften their communities. We would take vacant lots where drug dealers would hang out. People would just drive right by because they'd see a bunch of young men or women hanging out. And uh, we, we would do this. I call these flower explosions. We'd, uh, we'd engage the community and get the community involved. And one day we'd take a vacant lot, bring in 75 yards of compost, put it down, plant these uh, uh, circular beds, and all of a sudden uh, you had this beautiful uh, flowers growing on a vacant lot that was, you know, trashy, and so, and all of a sudden it just changed the dynamics of that vacant lot. The drug dealers went away because, again, people started looking at that vacant lot, looking at the flowers, saying, wow, that's beautiful, and I guess the drug dealers felt uncomfortable, so they went on down the, down the road to some other vacant lot, I guess. Um, then we started getting groups that had heard about what we were doing from out west, the native communities where diabetes rates had reached 50% or higher, 
and they would come in and they wanted to work with their young people to, because a lot of the elders were not into farming and they wanted to start with the young people. Uh, so that started to happen in Inglewood where there was a murder in Chicago, a murder a day in Inglewood. Uh, we put up uh, hoop houses and start growing food there. And then in 1995, uh, the Journal Sentinel, a major newspaper, wrote a front page story about me working with these kids and it kind of launched us in the turn of the century to what growing power is today. <clears throat> and this is what our facility looks like today. You can see the transformation that has taken place. Uh, the back lot is full, filled now with high tunnels where we grow food. We have a lot of uh, renewable energy. A fourth of our energy uh, is derived by solar. Uh, we have solar, a uh, quarter of our uh, electricity, 70% of our heated water. Uh, we call this place our community food center. It's anchored in the northwest side of town, and a community food center is a place where people come to get uh, advice to purchase food. We're in a food desert. Thousands of people live in this area. Three mile, you have to travel over three miles away to get your food. So the only healthy food is the food that we grow at our place. <coughs> Growing Power is one of the only multicultural, multi-generational organizations in a country of its size that's led by a person of color. Uh, it's something that I really value, uh, this idea of diversity, bringing folks together and, uh, you know, creating the environment. Because if you're going to have diversity, I don't care whether it's a university or whatever, you have to create an environment that, that breeds diversity. It's not something that just happens automatically. You have to uh, create an environment that people feel comfortable coming to and they want to they wanna be a part of it. They like this kind of environment and it really reflects what our country is becoming and what our country really is. So uh, when you come to Growing Power, you'll see a very diverse uh, staff. We have over 100 uh, staff now uh, and a very diverse staff of folks. So these are some of the faces of the people that come to Growing Power for uh, tours and trainings. Uh, uh, and visits every day as we tour people every day at the facility. Uh, over 15,000 last year. Uh, we have over 5,000 volunteers. We, we get more volunteers than any, all the organizations combined in Milwaukee, including museums, and you put them all together, we get more volunteers than, than they do. And this is about food. This is about food systems. So, So I'll go through this. Uh, I think you guys thought I was kidding when I said that. Uh, you know, every PowerPoint is a couple of images, but this is the real deal. So these are the faces of folks that uh, come to Growing Power, people that we work with. Even these guys. <laughs> And it's really about locally grown food. That's what it's all about. We celebrate food. If you come to our workshops, you spend a weekend with us, you don't have to go out anywhere to eat. You're going to eat locally grown food because that's what this is all about. It's about, uh, it's about our locally grown food and celebrating food. And uh, that's very important to us to make sure that we do that. And everybody uh, has seen this guy go through your neighborhood, right? to pick up your garbage, and they, I guess they want us, to, I hope nobody works or has any family that works for this company, but uh, they want us to think that they think green. They say they have over 17,000 acres of wildlife habitat, but I've been up to their landfills, and the only thing I see is seagulls and really big rats, so I don't know what they're talking about. And of course they don't pollute those trucks that run on uh, electricity, I think. Uh, but it's really all about the soil and the materials that they carry into the landfill is something that we rescue to be able to grow uh, that healthy soil. Diverting uh, the waste from the landfill is what it's all in. Like I said, we're doing 22 million pounds 
But to do that, you have to develop relationships with people that have that waste. You just don't, it just doesn't appear on your site. So building relationships is such an important thing, uh, and I'm sure you guys uh, know all about that, building relationships. Uh, we're in a city where we have a lot of brewery waste, a lot of brewery grains, from spent grains from our brewery industries, a lot of microbreweries. We pick up 80,000 pounds a week just from one. We have four different sites in Woodship. We're a state with 68% forest. Uh, we're chipping every day, municipalities, and many of my farm friends were in the dairy state. We have a lot of moldy hay when it rains, so we turn that into uh, compost as well. Fruits and vegetables, many times they never leave the boxes. They come in, we pick up 20,000 pounds from one wholesaler every week that never leaves the box. And that normally would wind up in the landfill. So we rescue that and then we put it into piles like this, the cardboard, because guess where cardboard comes from? It comes from Mother Earth, so it needs to go back. And then we compost. We do over a million pounds of compost at this site, but at our large uh, four-acre site on the lakefront, we do much more, 200 feet away from where people live. And people always ask us, how do you do that? Well, part of it is, uh, first of all, engaging the community. So the community know what you're doing and they look at it as an asset. And, and it's the way that you do it in terms of not causing, uh, causing smells and not causing a nuisance. So we're able to do it. Uh, before this, they'll call the city, they'll call us if there's a problem. Because I can't guarantee you when we're loading the truck that we get some anaerobic smells that may drift off into the community, but they don't call the city and complain. They call us and ask us what's going on. That's when you know you've engaged the community, mm -hmm. when that happens. So um, that's very important in doing this work or any kind of work in the community. So this is the soil we need. And the reason that we need this soil is because this compost is because our soils are contaminated. It's not responsible to go out and get a rototiller and start farming in any city, uh, digging up the soil because all you're doing is, uh, you know, mixing uh, contaminants. So we put two feet of new soil before we grow anything on top. To do that, you need not just hundreds of yards, you need thousands of yards of compost to be able to do that. And it's a process that EPA has uh, gotten behind. They really like our protocol of doing that. We have no digging equipment. So we are not spending thousands of dollars buying tractors or rototillers and things like that. We're growing soil. That's what it's all about. And if you're ever able to grow soil, you can grow healthy food uh, that grows healthy people, that grows healthy community. So we teach people how to compost. In this 4x4 four four configuration, it takes 40 wheelbarrow loads of material in just a 4x4, four four, just to give you a perspective of how much you really need to collect. In a 4x4 four four configuration of, of pallets, it takes 40 wheelbarrow loads to fill that up. And then you have to maximize it. So you get somebody up on there and you start pounding it down. <laughs> this is one of our workshops. <laughs> <laughs> and people are fascinated by worms. It's like uh, something that, regardless of whether they're kids or adults, they really like worms. <laughs> and this is what the finished product looks like. And that happens in eight months in a static state where you don't turn, or three months when you turn it. So that's what we have to do. And then we scale it up uh, at a rural farm. We have a 30-acre rural farm, our first large composting site, to be able to do it on a larger scale. And then once you have that wonderful compost, then you can feed it to the worms. And, and then the worms turn it into something even better as they eat through that material. And those worms uh, multiply microorganisms by 14 times. So if they take in 250 million count of micro, when they're eating their food, they're multiplying that uh, by 14 times, whatever 14 times 250 million uh, is. So they make it better. They make this uh, organic fertilizer uh, that's a nutrient replacement for our soil because when we water plants, we leach out some of the nutrient and you have to replace that. And arguably, uh, worm castings are the best uh, fertilize in the world. Works better than miracle Grow, and I, I know none of you use miracle Grow. So. <laughs> uh, 
So these are about seven different varieties of, of, of worms, of red worms. Now, red worms are remediators. They remediate uh, bad things in the soil. They can take in uh, E. coli. They crush. They're the only organism that crushes E. coli in their gut. So when you have compost and you put worms in there, they clean it up. Our compost is E. coli free, and that's very important because if you grow compost and it's got a lot of E. coli, you can pass that on to the crops and so forth. And that's one of the reasons you hear about these food scares and uh, that we've had and people getting sick from E. coli and so forth. But these worms are wonderful. <laughs> we started with 30 pounds. We have 7,000 pounds of worms in our farms. Now. And we market those worms. We ship them all over the country. If you guys want worms, just call us. <laughs> ship them to your dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that's a cocoon where 20 worms comes out of that little golden egg. And I've seen it happen. You can actually see that happening. I wish they had a film of that. And it's a very, uh, it's a transformative moment when you put 200 worms in a kid's hand. Uh, you know, at first they get a little afraid, but after a while they want to hold them and uh, they get very interested. And that's how you create these scientists, you know. A moment like that might turn that young person into wanting to dig deeper and do something. Even, even the adults are very fascinated by worms. <laughs> Look at this guy. He's like uh, really into it, you know. <laughs> and then we get our worms out. We use a screening method because these are our livestock. Our worms are worth about $300,000. So, um, that's very important. They're just as important as a steer or a pig or any other livestock. So we look at them as livestock. And some of these varieties live over 20 years. So it's important that they continue to work for us. When I say we have over 100 employees, we really got about 100 billion employees. <laughs> and the thing about those employees I really like because they never talk back to you. <laughs> they just go do their thing. All you have to do is feed them. And then we sell that worm, uh, as the kids say, worm poop, for, for uh, $2 a pound wholesale, $4 a pound uh, retail. So there's money in that waste. So eight months ago, that was food waste and carbon waste. Now it's the highest quality organic fertilizer on earth. And then we turn that into, uh, into uh, compost tea. And compost tea is something that, again, you spray on plants. It works as a fertilizer. It also works as a insect repellent because research has shown, uh, uh, Rodell has done a lot of research on when that uh, material is on a leaf, insects don't want to invade that leaf. So that's really important. And we have these worm depositories. We have some that are 250 yards. And uh, remember those three barrel configurations that you saw earlier? Now we have these systems that hold 10,000 gallons of water. We're using space uh, in the greenhouse that you don't normally leave, use down below the ground. Uh, this system right here holds 10,000 gallons and it will grow 10,000 fish. One, uh, gallon, one fish per gallon of water. And it also acts as a heating source. We heat that water to 85 degrees for tilapia and having that thermal mass of heat is like geothermal or keep the greenhouse much better than forced air heat. So that's another benefit that we have. And in this system, in this high tunnel out back, that, where you saw those earlier pictures, we have two systems at 20,000 gallons of water on the right. We're raising tilapia, heating that to 85 degrees on the left. At ambient temperature, we're raising lake perch um, at uh, 10,000 lake perch and 10,000 gallons of water. And the lake perch uh, bring $18 or more uh, a pound uh, filleted. Uh, if we had two million pounds of filleted lake perch right now, we could have it sold by tonight. That's how much in demand because we can't fish uh, for lake perch anymore in the Great Lakes. There's a moratorium on uh, commercial fishing for that species because of lack of fish and mercury contamination. So it's a huge opportunity. Fish farms, uh, I get calls every day. Fish farms are popping up all over the place, but there's a problem. We don't have enough 
We don't have enough fingerlings. We don't have enough hatcheries to hatch out enough uh, baby fish to fill these systems. So it's one thing about building infrastructure. If you can build all the infrastructure you want, but you have to have something to put in that infrastructure. So a lot of people are learning that lesson when they just launch into it without doing their homework. So we're getting uh, vegetable production and fish production in these systems that we built because uh, we pump the water up, it gravity feeds through the system, it remediates. Uh, the remediation come, happens with the nitrates uh, and the fish survive because of that. The plants take the nitrates out and we grow the plants, we harvest those plants and at the end of uh, a year you have $50,000 per system in a system that costs about $3,000. The conventional systems for that same system would cost over $100,000 of capitalization. So uh, we're doing research with the Great Lakes Institute on seven different types of systems. A hybrid system, uh, something between ours and the RES system, which is a high density system that they use that has filters that take out the waste, but very expensive. Um, so we're gonna have that research in the next uh, uh, two years to be able to pass on this research that's never been done before. But to do that, we're partnering with the university to be able to do that uh, research. Here's our staff adding some of the 10,000 lake perch. Those are tilapia, that's what they look like. Those are uh, lake perch, tilapia, lake perch, <laughs> tilapia. <laughs> and that's uh, a new fish that we're, it's a pacu. It's a Brazilian fish that eats vegetation. Uh, they're, in, uh, they're related to uh, piranha. They get up to 60 pounds and we're doing some research on those. The fish, that fish is delicious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely tastes better than any fish I've had before. Uh, but uh, the only place you can really get this fish in big quantities in the Amazon, uh, they eat uh, nuts that fall into the river. They have teeth like humans. They can crack a nut, but they're vegetarian. They're not carnivores. Uh, so the meat has omega-3 in the meat like a lot of Norwegian type fish. So that's something that we're doing research on. and uh, We'd like to raise these possibly in the future and then we grow some koi. We don't eat those. Though. Don't worry. Uh, we're also uh, producing food, natural foods. This is black soldier fly larvae, 42% protein. These come from a little... Uh, black fly that lays uh, about over 2,000 eggs, uh, then they die. They don't have a mouth. <clears throat> These larvae uh, grow out, some of them grow out to the flies, and then they lay eggs back in the waste. The larvae eat waste, and they leave behind a casting. If you have worms, the worms will follow up and eat their castings, and you produce kind of a super casting. But uh, those larvae, uh, we built a system to harvest the larvae and this 55 gallon drum there's over 200,000 in there. So we'll be using that to feed fish and chickens in the future because the cost of feed is predicated on the cost of oil. You know, 25% of our energy is used in food, uh, uh, moving food around and producing, uh, producing uh, feed for livestock. So now we have that back area you saw earlier back in the, um, in the 90s, and now we have these high tunnels, and uh, we use uh, compost. There's no fossil fuel used to grow over 40 different crops. Around the exterior of these buildings in the wintertime, we put compost at 150 degree temperature on the exterior walls, no cold air can enter, because your cold air typically enters on the base of uh, your houses. So we put over a uh, 1,000 yards of material, and you can see how hot that material. And then we uh, again grow on 36-inch uh, uh, beds, tw 24 inches high, and we're able to grow these greens year-round. very intensive. And the reason that we can grow this intensive is because of the energy in the soil. 
that we have so much energy from the compost and the vermicompost, and this is a way for the future of how much you grow in a square foot. We're going to have to start looking at farming instead of acreage or hectares or whatever in terms of square footage. And if you can grow at $5 a square foot, that's, 200, that's over $200,000 an acre. If you're able to grow like we do our sprouts, which we turn over every week at $50 a square, that's over a million dollars an acre. If you're able to grow an acre of sprouts and market those. But this is how we're going to be growing food in the future, if we're to survive. We have to grow more intensively. We have to use the resources that we have. We have to be creative. And we have to uh, come up with a distribution system that makes sense. But production is a piece that we've got to solve. That's where we're at. We have, to, we have to learn how to produce this way. And that's what we're lagging behind. Everybody wants to do it. But we have to learn how to do it. That's my grandson. He wants to be a farmer. And that's my uh, photographer's son. He's having a Zen moment, I think. <laughs> Hoping, thinking about whether he wants to become a farmer. Uh, one of the uh, indestruct indestructible crops that I don't know if anybody here eats kale, but if you ate kale every day, you'd probably be healthy as, a, as they say, a horse. Uh, kale is in the top five of most nutritious crops. It'll grow in the worst conditions. You don't have to cover this up in the wintertime, even in Wisconsin. You certainly can grow it here in North Carolina throughout the winter in, in a high tunnel and produce tremendous crops of kale. Intensive production, whether it's indoors or outside, that's what we have to do. We have to get these little 30 acre farms back into production and you guys got a bunch of them with tobacco uh, uh, system that's gone south. You got a lot of small farms that we can convert into this kind of production. Intensive field production. Just as intensive as inside the hoop houses, but you have to get your soil right. It's all about the soil. To be able to grow salad mix like this. Bulls, bulls blood beets. Salad mixes. Those are the things that are healthy. <laughs> Intensive greenhouse production using every space, taking Taking this room, for example, and turning this into, if this is uh, uh, 1,000 square feet, we turn it into uh, 3,000 square feet by using vertical space. And that's what it's all about, not just growing on one plane like we used to. By having multiple crops, fish integrated with plants, mushrooms. We've come up with this thing called mushroom chandeliers to grow mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms uh, inside our fish systems dipping those logs in, promoting the growth, cutting down uh, the uh, growth time by doing that, coming up with techniques, experimenting, researching, finding out what are new ways of increasing production. Sprouts, we turn over 3,000 trays a week. These sprouts go to the Milwaukee Public School students. It's the healthiest food that they eat. Over 40,000 students eat these sprouts as an afternoon snack. Restaurants are buying these uh, Mushrooms out of these chandeliers, these are grown in straw. Very cheap way of growing mushrooms. $16 a pound to restaurants. This is what helps fund the organization and um, the work that we do. Um, you can't do enough grant writing. Over 50% of our income comes from our own efforts of selling products and services. Over 40 different income streams to do our work. We just can't write grants and write ourselves into uh, a success. So uh, having this social entrepreneurial organization is really something that is a way for the future also. But growing vertically, growing multiple crops using vertical space is really important. 
and we teach people how to do that. They come to workshops. This is uh, one of our latest farms. It took us six weeks to build out this farm. It will eventually have about 80 high tunnels to produce thousands and thousands of pounds of food year-round. It's right on the lakefront. So imagine all this space in different areas of the city, whether it's at a, a cemetery, greenhouses, where we have actually a farm at a cemetery, whether it's uh, out in uh, Oak Creek here uh, working with the sewage district that owns this land, finding land uh, that we can get to grow food. And training these young people that didn't were not carpenters, but in a year they can build them by themselves. And having a harvesting team uh, that goes out and harvests that food and building these these structures from scratch, saving 50% of the cost if you had to buy this uh, buy this material <coughs> or put up these structures. And of course, the soil, not growing into existing soil. Thousand images. <laughs> Tomatoes. Bug free. Okra. We can't grow okra like you guys. We don't have the warm weather, so we grow it inside a, a high tunnel. Peppers. And we process everything ourselves. And we have to get GAP certified. We have to go through all these certifications to help the department. The Department of Agriculture visits us to make sure our facility is sanitary and clean and we can do this. We process this product. Uh, and the finished product looks like this. The preferred salad mix on the market. Okay, we need more energy. We don't have enough energy. We have to come up with innovative ways of growing energy. We got to grow soil, we got to grow, we also have to grow energy. For us to cash flow this future farms we're talking about, this future uh, system that you guys are discussing in your class, we're going to have to grow energy. It's not going to work unless we have renewable energy. So this is another way of growing renewable energy. Not all the food waste needs to go into compost. We can take food waste and put it into big tanks like this and create energy. This is a high solid anaerobic digester. This is the first step to producing the energy. And this is a system that I have a partner. We developed this system where we uh, grind uh, food waste into a slurry. We suck it in this tank. It has four chambers. It's heated up to 100 degrees to activate the microorganisms that produces acetic acid. Then we change the uh, bacterial structure of the acetic acid from low pH to high pH. <laughs> and then we take that acetic acid. It can be stored for over a year and turned into energy, whereas the other energy sources you have to use right away. But this is an energy source that we can store. So taking the food waste, that's Mark, uh, my business partner in this. <laughs> We take food waste and we grind it into a slurry on the exterior of the, of the system and then we suck it into the system and then it, uh, we have an a auger inside that augers it for about a month and we get the acetic acids up to 22,000 per milligram and then we ex start extracting 1,000 gallons a day from that system and then we build, we're going to build a methane digester uh, methane, of course, is an explosive process, so we have to put it in an industrial area. And then we'll pr produce methane, scrub it clean, run it through a, a high-tech generator, generate electricity, sell it to our utility, get energy credits uh, to be able to pass those on. Uh, we build our own, uh, we have a, a construction uh, 
component of our organization now, again, different types of jobs. We've got people that are carpenters, plumbers, and so forth working for us now to build these kind of structures to be able to put up very expensive system. This system cost over $100,000. It'll pay dividends in a few years. We get 22 cents a kilowatt hour for our production. We pay 10.8. It's a tremendous opportunity. But the upfront cost prevents a lot of folks from doing it. So it took us a lot of years. Solar hot water. 70% of our uh, heated water comes from solar. So we built, working with a, a company, Kalefi in the Menominee Valley, very interested, never done this before. Uh, we built this system. Um, it's a very delicate system. We had to go down six feet in the ground below the <coughs> cross line to build this strong structure to put these panels on. And we have 24 large panels that produce 70%. <coughs> These panels get up to 300 degrees. We have to sometimes when we have uh, really hot uh, summer days, we have to get rid of some of the heat before it goes into the system. Water catchment. We're capturing all the water, 100% of the water off of our buildings into catchment systems because that's a really important thing for our city. We have a combined sewer system that if it overflows, they shut off the sewage system. It backs up into the into the system, they release it into the creeks, the raw sewage goes into Lake Michigan. So for us to divert that water from going into the street, uh, our sewage district had a grant program, so we built this system to capture all of the water. It goes down the gutters, down below, and into a system that doubles as a fish system, and then we also pressurize the water and we water our plants with that. We also have animals on this urban farm, over 50 goats. And these goats produce, uh, produce uh, milk. They're alpine goats. They're very communal kind of animals. And these are some of the healthiest goats you'll ever see because we feed them food waste. Uh, goats will eat anything. They'll eat clothes, whatever you, whatever they get them, you know. But eating that food waste, uh, along with a uh, little bit of grain. These are very healthy goats. And goats are very curious creatures. <laughs> and we have over 500 layers on the farm, right in the city. They produce brown eggs and we market those. We can't grow it. Now, a program, I have a breeding program for uh, turkeys. Uh, these are heirloom turkeys um, and these turkeys uh, as a matter of fact, these two guys look like some folks I know, so <laughs> kind of like them. Uh, and then bees. Uh, there's more bee production in the city than in rural areas. Milwaukee has a bee ordinance now that we can have bees in the city. Uh, if you have a home, you can have, uh, I believe, two hives per home with a permit and four chickens with a permit. So we're one of the more progressive cities uh, today in terms of raising livestock and things that are reasonable. But we train people how to become uh, beekeepers. And that's an important thing because if you eat local honey, it gets rid of a lot of allergies and things and a, a tremendous income stream because we get over 100 pounds of honey per hive. In rural America today, we only get about 50 pounds per hive. There's a lot more flora. Then we sell this under urban honey label as part of our income to keep ourselves going. I like this image because this is downtown Chicago. And we're growing corn in downtown Chicago. These are some of the projects. One of my uh, projects that I really like is working with uh, folks that are uh, disabled but not handicapped. Because the, this uh, lady was blind. In a half hour, she learned how to seed uh, sprout tray, how to harvest the sprout tray, totally blind. Uh, so we work with all different types of of folks that come to Growing Power. Catholic Charities. Uh, these senior uh, immigrants uh, would go here uh, during the days and play cards, but they really didn't want to play cards. They wanted a garden. So what we did when I went over and looked at the site, I saw some asphalt over there. We also grew on asphalt and concrete. We put down wood chip. We built beds on top of the wood chip. Uh, and now these immigrants have a garden. Uh, Coles Corporation, one of the major corporations, they're a big department store chain, over a thousand stores, they're building another 200. 
uh, one of our funders. They wanted uh, gardens. We built gardens on their corporate campus. At, they have an in-house daycare center, so these young uh, preschoolers uh, are able to go out in the garden and taste some of the food. Very intensive production. City of Milwaukee, the mayor wanted to have a garden like the White House, so we put a garden at City Hall. Our interns came in uh, and we brought in uh, uh, about 50,000 pounds of compost, and now they, every year we have a garden there. The garden gets harvested by these young people that work for the forestry department. It goes out to food pantries, so they're eating healthy food that's grown in downtown. Rockwell Automation, another international company, 2,000 employees. They wanted their employees to become healthier. They wanted a farm stand. We put a farm stand in Discovery World, a uh, museum on the lakefront. Uh, we built a um, aquaponic system. We're raising fish and plants, and thousands of people see uh, Forest Home Cemetery. The cemetery director called me and uh, had greenhouses that hadn't been used for five years. So we uh, went in and repaired the greenhouses. Now we're keeping people out of that upper, upper left-hand quadrant a little bit longer if they eat that healthy food. <laughs> so uh, my point is that we can grow gardens anywhere. We should be looking for spaces that are available in our cities and even in our rural areas uh, where agriculture has gone south in terms of family farms. Uh, working with Cisco, Cisco is the delivery system, the largest, uh, uh, the largest uh, uh, distributor of food in the country. We work with them. We have a, a cooperative uh, agreement with them. Uh, they take our food. They deliver it to the Milwaukee public schools. They also deliver all the food and all the uh, local public school municipalities. The only way to get food into those schools is to go get involved in the Cisco program. So uh, that's something that we've been able to do. That's their facility right across the street from our farm, and we're able. How's that time going? Yeah, we have about ten minutes yeah. left for the whole class. Oh, I'm can sorry. We, can we, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go real fast, and we'll do some questions. <laughs> this is Cisco. Uh, Hundred thousand carrots we grew uh, at Cisco. At Cisco. New Berlin, another farm, very intensive production. Uh, with the mayor here, we put in 40 gardens in our community. This is our new store that we're building out. This is our compost facility uh, where we're doing 22 million pounds. We, we do this throughout the winter. Every day we're composting there. Regardless of the weather, it doesn't matter. You have to move that waste away from the places that we have, over 40 of them. We also get 80,000 pounds. Menominee Valley, another area that uh, is available for us to farm that we're going to develop. This is a farm uh, a building, a 55,000 square foot building that I own. We're turning it into a fish hatchery, being rehabbed right now. And uh, we already have hoop houses built on the facility outside. So we'll be planting those. This uh, is a uh, green development by students, building a green garage from the ground up, totally off the grid, year-round growing. Uh, Badger School, we're building a new school in Madison with another organization. It's an agricultural school, Boys and Girls Club, uh, wanted food. We have this five-acre uh, farm site at a school. We're almost there. and young people, working with them, and working with co-ops around the country. This is in Georgia. This is the Blackfeet Nation. We're working with them out in Browning, Montana, to grow food. They're not traditional farmers in New Orleans after Katrina, rebuilding the food system. We're now working in Mississippi with the Young People's Project, Buffalo, New York. Uh, working with the, and this is Chicago, the most aesthetic garden in the country probably, in Grant Park, the front doorstep of Chicago, 150 different. We've operated this farm, two-acre farm, for the last seven years. And Cabrini Green, probably the most famous housing project in the country, a peace garden, a gentrification is coming from the east. Uh, this is uh, uh, funded by the Fourth Presbyterian Church. This is our future farm. We, we're in there now. Uh, on the south side of Chicago. Jackson Park, another farm in Chicago. Downtown Chicago, this was our first project. We work with schools in Chicago. Once you bring that soil in, anything is possible. 
We were at the uh, Flower and Garden Show the last two years, the famous Chicago Flower and Garden Show, and these young people uh, changes their lives. Our market basket program and international work. We're working in Kenya. Uh, this is landfill in Kenya, a rudimentary fence around the waste. They have soil fertility problems in Africa as well. So it's all about the soil. And Ukraine. Now that the Russians are gone, the Ukrainians, it used to be the breadbasket of Europe. In London, behind walls, uh, there are farms in central London, believe it or not. So everybody around the world is involved. Uh, these are some of our training uh, uh, partners around the country, our regional training centers in, in Mississippi, Mound Bayou, the oldest black municipality in the country, is going back into farming. Many of the rural Farm towns are going seven harvest in Arkansas, another one of our re regional training centers. Breaking new grounds in Louisville, Kentucky, another one. Lynchburg grows an uh, old rose greenhouse, and now they're growing food and growing soil and growing these young people. Minnesota Women's Environmental Institute working with uh, uh, an Indian nation in Minneapolis. T-Town in Detroit, where there are no uh, retail grocery stores in the city, 169 square miles of vacant land. But now this organization uh, is working with us. Toledo Gardens in Columbus, Ohio, uh, near the campus. Cleveland at the Forgotten Triangle, 26-acre uh, agricultural zone uh, uh, farms are going up. Blair Grocery in uh, New Orleans in the Ninth Ward. This is a farm in the Ninth Ward, bed -Stuy in Brooklyn. We built this farm out this past summer. So now they're growing food and putting it in there. Uh, University of District of Columbia, we just finished excavating a one-acre composting pad. They'll be composting for all the projects in Washington, D.C. area. Some of the future projects, working with the Clinton Global Initiative, and this is our uh, hallmark project. We're building a five-story vertical farm at our national headquarters. It'll be the first one in the world uh, to grow food on five different stories. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll take some questions for five minutes and answer them as quick as I can. Yes. Yes, and that's what we're quantifying. We have over 200 acres of production right now. We're going to double that production in the, in the next couple of years. We're going to put up 100 acres of greenhouses. So it's important uh, for us to grow more intensively. We have less land. Uh, like I said before, we're going to have to figure this out. And people have to learn the skills to be able to do that. And it's going to take a lot of different categories of people working to be able to do this. And like I said, renewable energy is one of the keys. And of course, growing enough soil, which is the most challenging piece for organizations around the country. Yes? I was going to ask, um, I'm also a Nichols School of the Environment student. Um, since soil is such an issue, do you use any hydroponic systems in your farm? And for the vertical farm, would that be a consideration? Okay, do we use any hydroponic systems? So, uh, what was the first part of that? Yes, but we do hydroponics much differently than everybody. We don't grow directly in the water. We grow in soil that sits in water, and the water gets wicked up into the uh, root zone of the plants. But we have a full spectrum of, of nutrients. And a, a hydroponic natural system, you don't have that full spectrum because we're important. It's important to have that full spectrum of nutrients in, you, in your crops. Yes, in the back. Yes. Um, the question is uh, fish, uh, farm-raised fish not being as healthy as uh, wild fish. Uh, not true. It depends on the system and how you raise them. The way we raise them is a replication. It's actually cleaner than the typical fish you find in, in the wild. 
because of everything in our systems is natural and it should be, uh, it's just like uh, wild, only we don't have all the contaminants and so forth. Yes? Um, when you took over vacant land, mm -hmm. um, was that just a payment, clean and claim, or was that actually buying it or being in touch with the, whoever owned it? Well, we have uh, so many different situations. The qu question is, uh, when we, we get land, um, whether it's given to us, I guess, or whether it comes from different sources. There are different types of situations. Some of the land we purchase, some of the land we lease, some of the land is free in our system. Yes, sir. So, um, I think it's already close. Just wondering what happens if, like, theoretically, uh, industrial farming and everything cleans up their act and stops having so much waste. What other sources do you use for compost? Well, I don't, uh, the question is, did everybody hear that question? Okay. Um, what do we do if, if the industrial system cleans up the act? So we have zero waste? Right. I don't think uh, we have any fear of that anytime soon. <laughs> to be quite, uh, that's, we're only collecting a fraction of what goes in the landfill. Okay. Great question. Yes, sir. Well, that's a tough question. Uh, how much capital does it take to start an urban farm? It depends. I, of course, nobody would give me any capital, so a sweat equity was the rule of the day. Uh, I wouldn't want you to go through that. Uh, I think we've made it a lot easier for you to, to get uh, capitalization to start a, a, a small farm there. There's a lot of government programs that you can get. It depends on whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit. Uh, there's not much difference between being a for-profit or a non-profit, by the way. We can make just as much money as any for-profit, and we've been able to cash flow our farm. We actually make money farming as a non-profit and able to pay our employees a living wage, and that's our goal, is to create jobs as part of our mission vision. Yes. Everybody heard that? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, we want to make sure everybody has access to the same food. So we can, uh, we have different ways of delivering that food. But what I think the main thing that we're doing is teaching people how to grow uh, in their systems themselves, in their backyards, side yards, and, um, you know, organizations and so forth. Uh, that's really important to me. We have a new program that we're launching in about two weeks called 20,000 Backyard Farms. We're going to hopefully um, uh, start 20,000 backyard farms in southeast Wisconsin. And to make that happen, we, uh, I'm going to corporate companies that I work with to help fund it for low-income folks so that they can grow their own food. It's a very powerful thing to be able to produce your own food. Uh, that's the way I grew up, and many people uh, in the past used to have food is a very powerful thing to have if you're food secure. Two more questions. Yes. I'll speak a little loud. I didn't hear that. Where are we getting that last part? Oh, okay, okay. Um, the question is um, about uh, raising uh, farm-raised fish because that's a, a lot of uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there in terms of that. Uh, the way uh, and I tried to uh, demonstrate it in uh, how we raise fish, how we raise our own um, inputs, natural inputs to feed the fish. That's really important to be able to feed like tilapia. They're pretty much vegetarian, so we feed them vegetable waste. Their favorite food is algae. So we're going to be growing algae 
They grow faster on algae than anything else. They're cichlids, so they're taking in food as they breathe. They're not carnivores. So if you're able to uh, feed them vege vegetables and things that affixes uh, omega-3 in their meat, and that's what we want to eat, fish with omega-3. Um, of course, lake perch are carnivores. We don't feed them other fish. So uh, that's why I ate this thing around worms and uh, black soldier fly larvae at 42% protein. That's much higher than any commercial fish food to be able to feed them. So we're doing that research. That's part of the research that we're going to be doing over the next two years to see how long it takes to raise out a fish using all natural means versus fish that we're using commercial uh, fish food in different types of systems, whether it's the RES systems and the high density uh, systems that commercial fisheries are using or versus our systems that cost a fraction of what those systems cost. So we're going to be doing in hybrid systems uh, between the RES system and our natural system. So we'll be doing a lot of that research and also fish breeding too. To increase the fish breeding is going to be uh, something, otherwise we never, we're not going to have enough fish. Uh, unless we're able to solve that issue. Last question. Yes, ma'am. So, do you face any types of challenges in terms of legalizing your production? Um, like, what are the legal issues that you face in bringing your produce to the market, and how did you um, overcome it? Uh, the question is, what challenges do we have to overcome to getting our product to the market? Um, what's that? Legalize. Uh, well, we uh, when I bought the farm, it was the last registered farm. So legally, I could farm and grow anything I wanted to grow on their farm. Uh, we had to change policy for other people to be able to do that. And there are some restrictions on your size versus what you're doing. So if you only got one acre, there are some restrictions on how much you can compost, how much you can, how much you can fit on that uh, that footprint. Um, uh, looking at it, but uh, many of the, um, the policies are outdated. So if you're growing intensively, they really have no way of measuring that piece. So uh, nor are they interested. And once you're able to break down the barriers and you can work with the city, uh, they want to promote. They, the city of Milwaukee wants to be the urban ag capital of the world and the water capital of the world. That's what the city leaders want, want Milwaukee uh, to be, and I think we're already there with the food piece in terms of having the largest urban ag uh, organization in the, in the world. So, um, you know, uh, the city is very much behind what we're doing. They look at, uh, we bring in, we brought in about $15 million over the last uh, seven years to Milwaukee via the workshops. This year we have a, a uh, and conferences. We'll have a conference in September 7th, 8th, and 9th that'll bring in 3,000 people into the city of Milwaukee, a national, international urban ag and small farm conference uh, with 17 different uh, tracks. So uh, they look at us in a very positive way because we're bringing, cities start looking at you different when you're bringing in money and visitors to the city. <laughs> so. Well, Alan, quite literally a force of nature. Um, Keep eating your kale, and your perch. Keep going and doing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And so we'll go upstairs, and Will Allen will join us for a meal. <laughs>